Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we praise your name for this morning again. We thank you for the great men you've been using in our midst to declare your truth, your mind for the hour to every one of us. Lord, we're all here to learn. All of us involved, whether we're preaching or we're doing any other thing, we know there are still heights that we want to take us to, depths that we want to take us to. And the only way we can get to the place you want us to get to is to listen when you are speaking. We thank you for what you have been saying since we came in here. And we thank you because you are doing something definite in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, in our ministries. And we know, Lord, that our ministries will never be the same in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that this very day, the word that you know that we need, you'll drop it by your spirit in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. It's something to hear with the ear. It's another thing for you to touch our spirit, to touch our soul, to touch our mind, the very depth of the seed of thought within us, to touch everything until you quicken us within in the inner man. And therefore, Lord, we're praying, you'll speak to our inner man in Jesus' name. Where there's been weakness, take weakness away. Where there's been discouragement, take discouragement away. Where there has been failure, take failure away. And where, Lord, the devil has been moving in any life to drive us back, to make us leave the world. You have told us that if we put our hands on the plan, we look back, we'll no more be fit for the kingdom of God. But, Lord, whatever the discouragement, whatever the problem, whatever the opposition or the persecution, we're not looking back. We're moving on. We're preaching the gospel. You have called us, and with Paul the apostle, we all re-echo that woe is unto us if we do not preach the gospel. Because this dispensation has been laid upon us, and we must do it. And we're not ashamed to declare that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And, Lord, in this country and beyond this country, we have committed ourselves that we will preach your gospel in Jesus' name. Empower us. Encourage us. Lift us up. And Lord, all that we need, the finance, the knowledge, the wisdom, the know-how, the planning, everything that we need, give unto us so that we'll preach the gospel effectively in Jesus' name. We we'll believe in you that great days are ahead of us. Great days not for us, but for you. But you are going to use us as instruments. And so, Lord, we pray that more than ever before, we will glorify you. We will preach your gospel. And multitudes will be saved through every one of your servants here represented today in Jesus' name. We pray for our brethren who did not have opportunity of coming here. Some hindered because of transportation. Some because they had problems in the assembly that... They just couldn't make it at this time. Some others because they didn't hear enough. Some others because they were not well motivated and they didn't know, they didn't hear from your spirit. They couldn't listen to you that something great was going to happen in their ministry. But Lord, you are a God of mercy. As you are blessing us here, Lord, we pray that in your own way, miraculously, you will draw them into the same blessing in Jesus' name. Lord, we're praying that next time, if Jesus tarries, and you give us opportunity to gather again, that those of us who are here now, and those who are not able to come, that Lord will come to feast at your table in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that anything you need to knock out of our lives, anything that you need to re-establish in our lives, heavenly qualities you need to pour into our spirit, the gifts and the power that you need to invest in our lives and ministries. Lord, we are open. We do not want to lose anything that you want to give us. Therefore, Lord, we pray that you pour out your very self into our spirits and souls in Jesus' name. Until, Lord, everything within us, everything that we have inside, will be drenched and filled and saturated with your mighty power, with your mighty anointing in Jesus' name. Without that anointing, without the impartation of your very self and your very mind and your very anointing and your very supernatural power, we cannot do what you have told us to do. We need everything that you have got to give us. 
We need everything that you have made available so that we can do what you want us to do. And Lord, we're looking up to you and we're open. Our cups are in the right position. Pour yourself into us in Jesus' name. This morning as we consider this word that you are giving unto us, Lord, we pray you'll quicken this word within us. You will challenge us. You will transform us. You will change us. And Lord, we will never give in to discouragement anymore in Jesus' name. Use us mightily to the glory of your name, to the salvation of multitudes, to the expansion of the kingdom of God, and to the building up of the church of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. We have come this morning to consider an important subject, a subject that has been well understood by some people of the past generation. And because of the understanding, as we read their biographies and their life histories, it appears that they never had anything that sidetracked them. Many years ago, I got hold of the book, The Memoirs of Charles G. Finney. That means his autobiography. And I read from chapter to chapter, and I discovered something that at that time was strange to me. That that man, as he continued in the preaching of the gospel, his word had so much power. If you read those words, the sermons on paper, sometimes, at least to me, and to a lot of other people, they look dry. It seemed as those words might not carry too much power. But reading in the biography, I saw that his words carried so much power, and people everywhere, they were coming to the Lord. I discovered eventually that he had a deep understanding of the subject we are considering this morning. And because of that, even though there were various schools of thought that fought against him, but he went on. Then I got hold of the books of John Wesley, and I discovered that he even started preaching with so much zeal before he got converted. And the messages he gave, and the letters he wrote, and the way he planned out his life, and the way he read the Bible, even, at, even before he was born again, put me to shame after I was born again. And then I began to try to discover the secret of so much power, so much authority. And eventually he got converted, 1738, and he started preaching the gospel with greater power, greater unction, greater determination. And I followed through in his diary how he preached the gospel and the great needs that he had. John Wesley, the father of Methodism, I discovered that he did not state divine healing like we Pentecostals state it today. But because of this subject we're studying about this morning that he understood, he sometimes got into his fear a realm of faith that challenged me even after I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. He was going on a journey to preach the gospel and his horse became lame and he himself became sick. And yet he knew that the people were waiting for him. He needed to preach to them. What will he do? He didn't stand on healing, that is preach healing every time the way we do now, Pentecostals. But because of the understanding of this message that we want to deliver this morning, he looked up to God and he said, God, if I'm still sick here and my horse is sick, no cattle ride at that time, how will I be able to get to these people and deliver the message? And he said, God, reveal your power. Heal me, heal my horse. Instantaneously, that horse, lame horse, got up. And he himself got well. And he went on to deliver the message. He was going to preach somewhere. And then with his team, I read in his diary, they had no water to drink. Instead of John Wesley, and when I mention John Wesley, we need to understand he was bright, bright scholar, student of Oxford, Oxford University. And in his days, People have said that he was a mighty writer with the pen. And anything that he wanted to defend with the pen, he could do it in such a marvelous way. And he was so sharp that he could have been a lecturer in any university at that time. But because of this subject, he would not. And as they were going on this particular day, no water to drink. But instead of John Wesley going back to say that this is too much for me, I cannot continue. They spotted a particular place, no shovel, no cutlass. No hoe, no digger, they were digging with their fingers. They were not Africans, British, white. And they were able to get out of the water by digging with their fingers. 
and they drank and went ahead. He was to preach in a place. When he got there, some people that hated him so much. Because if you have read in the history of uh, the British people, even those who are not Christians, they accept the fact that John Wesley changed the history of the British people in the 18th century by his preaching. Because of the vision he got, because of the revelation that he got, and because of his deep understanding of the subject of this morning, he came across a mall. They had clubs in their hands, sticks in their hands. They wanted to tear him to pieces. But you know, because of the understanding that he had, he didn't run back. I read that after I had been born again, and I asked myself, if I saw a mob like that, what would I have done? But John Wesley went ahead, and those people were waiting for him, just to destroy him. And he said, Lord, this might be my last audience, my last congregation. He opened his mouth, and he began to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those people dropped their sticks. By the time he finished, there were tears and some eyes, and some knew that the gospel is the eternal gospel. And this man will even endanger his life so that he can preach unto them. And John Wesley never wasted his time on non-essentials. He was coming to a particular place, and there was a narrow bridge that will take just one person. And this other fellow that hated John Wesley was coming the other direction. And John Wesley was going this way. And uh, so the fellow kept coming. Normally, one person should stop for the other. And the fellow kept coming furiously. And he looked at John Wesley in the face and he said, I never get um, aside, I never turn aside for a fool. That means you, bright scholar. Instead of going to university and lecturing, making a name in education, and you're wasting all your life on preaching, and never get aside for a fool. John Wesley looked at him and said, I always do. I always get aside for a fool. And he got aside, and he let him pass. Because of the understanding that he had, never wasted his time. Another person was William Booth the leader, the founder of the Salvation Army. You know what he said? He said, if he could do it, if he could convince God, he would let all the people that came to their Bible school spend 24 hours in hellfire. After that, he will release them and tell them to go out and preach, that none of them will come back and say that they were discouraged, that they will preach until they die. That man understood something. You know, C.H. Spurgeon, the prince of Baptist preachers, many, many years ago, last century actually, from the age of 20, he had been preaching to crowds of more than 20,000. And when he became a pastor in Britain, he still had um, the Spurgeon Tabernacle now in London, you, you discover from reading that he had a congregation of more than 5,000. But this is important for us to understand. He was about to wed. And he had been with this uh, lady that they were having courtship. But was about to go and preach. And it was a thick, thick crowd. And as he was uh, going with the PNC, eventually they missed one another because his mind was at the place where he will go to preach and went and went and went. He had forgotten about uh, that lady and then eventually he preached the word. And after preaching the word, the people dispersed and then was looking for the uh, wife to be but couldn't find her. And eventually he got back home and then went to see the lady and said, What happened? I missed you in the crowd. And the lady wouldn't talk. The lady was unhappy. How could you? You saw that large crowd were together. Instead of uh, going right to the stage with me, you let me alone. And so that's why I got angry. And then I came back. So Spurgeon looked at her and said, there's the right time to make the choice. 
I knew the Lord and I gave my life to the preaching of the gospel before I saw you. If our relationship will hinder the preaching of the everlasting gospel, let's decide it here, let's cut it off. And that lady realized that this man was a committed man. He understood the message of eternity. That's what we're talking about this morning. Eternity. We need to know that the people that are living today, all the sinners that we need to minister to, they're never dying souls. After death, there's life beyond the grave. And if the evangelist or the pastor, the general overseer, the pastor's wife, the Sunday school worker, if he does not understand the concept of eternity, the concept of the eternal past and the unending future, we will not be able to carry through and do the work we ought to do. When the Bible uses the word eternal, it means everlasting. It means unending. It means ever continuing. It means without end. In short, the Bible says forever and forever. Our minds, because we're finite, do not understand. We cannot conceive of life not ending. All we can understand, perhaps, is death. And after that, we do not understand a period, an age, when there will be no time, when having a wristwatch will be meaningless. Looking at the clock will be meaningless. Watching for days and night will be meaningless because it will be unending. And yet we need to understand that for most people, it is death that usher them into eternity. Death is a real experience for us. But even then, we are often sluggish in understanding how near death might be. Eternity for us will be beginning after death. And we do not know how near that eternity is because we do not know how near death is. I looked at the Bible and I saw in Numbers chapter 25, verses 6 and 9, an Israelite man. He was in sinful relationship with a Midianitish woman. There's something he didn't know. He didn't know that death was nearer than the sinner's bed. He thought he would get to that bed, enjoy himself. But between that place, between that decision to sin, and the bed where he was going, he was cut off. And he went to eternity unprepared. I looked at Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 32 and 33. There was a man called Agag. He thought, surely now the pangs of death have passed. Little did he know that death was near. And because he didn't know that death was near, there was no preparation. Did anybody tell Agag that there was eternity that stretched? to the unending future, after death. And Samuel said he should bring him. And eventually he died unprepared. In Second Samuel chapter 15, the young man, he was aiming for the throne. And he planned, and he got all his young men together to cry, long live the king, as if the king will never die. And he got in a battle with his own father, David. Little did he know when he saw that tree in front of him and he was still marching on, galloping on, riding on. Little did he know that death was nearer than the throne. He said, I will reign in this life. This throne, I will get it from my father, David. Young man. It's not, the race is not for him that runneth, 
or for him that is switch, swift, but it's determined by the Lord. And he met death before he got to the throne. In Judges chapter 4, verses 17 to 22, a man was running from an enemy. And he ran and ran until the enemy was out of sight. But little did he know that death was nearer than the pursuing enemy. He rested, he slept, he woke up on the other side. He had died. In Daniel chapter 5, a man called Belshazzar, he had a feast. And he thought that the time of enjoyment has come. That those who are talking about future, about death, are wasting time. Babylon was secured, impregnable. Because of the wonders they have made in Babylon. Because of the fence, because of the wall, because of the security, the son of Nebuchadnezzar thought that there was no danger. But that night he died. For him, death was nearer than the end of a pleasure feast. In 1 Kings chapter 22, Ahab, a monarch, a king, Little did he know. He wasn't willing to die. You know what he did? He disguised himself. He knew that death might come. But he wasn't ready at that time. So he disguised himself. And he told Jehoshaphat, you put on your king's robe and I'll just dress ordinary. He wanted to shift and transfer that death. But a man from the enemy camp drew the bow unawares. Not aiming at anything, just drew it. And he struck the man that death said, It's you I'm aiming for, not Jehoshaphat. And for him, death was nearer than his willingness to believe. You know, in Luke chapter 12, from verses 16 to 21, death was nearer than the dream of the schemer. This man said, I'll pull down my band. And I will say to my soul, you have many years ahead of you. Arise, take your ease and take your rest and begin to enjoy. And the Lord said, and death came. And God said, this night your soul will be required at your hand. And who shall all this be that you have provided for yourself? He died without a moment's preparation. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, as James, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Grant, he had prayed with his own brother that one of us will sit on, on one hand and the other one on the other hand. And Jesus said, that's ambitious. Are you willing to drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism I'll be baptized with? And they said, yes, Lord. So yes, you will do. But to give you one side here and the other side here is not mine to give. But the Father has reserved it for whomsoever that he desires. But he died. Before he realized the ambition of his heart. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted the honor of the church. The well done from the apostles. And, it, and Ananias came. And Peter looked at him and said, Is this so much your soul, the land? And he said, Yes. And without anybody knowing that anything was going to take place, Peter said, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You have not lied unto man, but unto God. Hearing that, he fell down, went out of this world, unprepared. The money they kept at home, the planning they had, how to spend that money, how to do this, how to do that, that plan did not come through. The wife was expecting. Why hasn't husband come back with certificate of commendation, certificate of honor, 
Maybe they are so happy with the apostles and they are dancing and rejoicing. Let me dress up and meet them in the rejoicing so that I do not miss the praise of those apostles. And she got there. And Peter said, tell me, woman, this is the story your husband told. Is it right? And she said, you better believe it. We've given everything we have, nothing reserved at all. Why have you conspired together? Hearing that, she died without preparation. For many people, death is nearer than the expected honor of the deceived and the deceitful. Remember Judas Iscariot? He got the 30 pieces of silver. But in any way he died without enjoying the reward of the betrayer. Many years ago I had the true story. A man came to church. The people were called big men today. Honorable men today. Rich men today. But he still found time to go to church. But he went to a church where God himself was on the move. Where the Spirit of God was speaking through the servants of God in that church. And he was living in adultery. And he came to church that Wednesday night in the prayer meeting. And the Spirit of God came upon the pastor and he said, Man, thus says the Lord, you're living in adultery. Rectify your life. Come to the Lord. Give yourself fully to the Lord. He looked at the pastor and he said, I am not living in adultery. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I'm saved. The pastor kept quiet. The following um, Wednesday, they had prayer meeting again. And whenever they had their prayer meeting, the Spirit of God moves in wonderful ways. And then the Spirit of God came on this man of God again and said, Man, the Lord is still saying what he said last week. You're living in adultery. Repent. Because you might endanger your life. No, pastor. I'm living right. And he came to another prayer meeting. He wasn't living right, but he was still attend. And he came to this one and the Lord said, If you do not repent, if you do not own up this time, endangering your life, and things are going to be very, very bad. He said, no, no, my heart. I love the Lord. I'm living right. Then he went back home. He had been in the practice of going to a particular woman. Whenever the husband was out of town, because the husband was a businessman, and people around, they were already gossiping, but the husband didn't know anything. And this particular day, the husband was going again on his business trip. And while he was at the petrol station, just buying petrol, the attendant at the petrol station looked at him and said, Sir, you're traveling too much. If you knew what happens whenever you travel, you wouldn't be traveling so much. So the man said, I don't understand you. Oh, he said, we all know the supposed to stay in town that your wife is not faithful, and that your wife is always, uh, you know, in relationship with a particular man. Whenever you're out of town, he said, no, I don't believe you. My wife cannot do that. And he said, go and find out. So, but they thought the man had traveled, and every man the man travels like that, this man will come to the woman. And the man had come there. And this man, wanting to check out, just check up what this patrol attendant said at the patrol station. So he turned his vehicle back and parked somewhere. But he had, this in America, he had his revolver in his hand. And he climbed through the staircase at the back. And he peeped into the, his own bedroom. And he saw the man. He was mad. He pulled out the gun, blew out his head. He died without preparation. The pastor told him. The pastor challenged him. The spirit of God was faithful and he told that man three times over and said, you are not living right, you are not living right. Correct your life. But you know, he will not. 
in the public because he was a rich church member. He said, no, pastor, I am all right. When he wasn't all right. And he died. Miserable death. And it came out in the newspapers in America. His head had been blown off. You see, many people are not prepared when death comes. And yet, I need to tell you that when death occurs here on earth, eternity begins for every man, for every woman who has passed away from the earth. And that man, that woman, will never stop living. He will live forever, eternally. Eternity has no end. Who can explain eternity for us to understand? Difficult. Because as human beings, we're used to years and months and weeks and days and hours and minutes. But if we could make any attempt of making an explanation, suppose it were possible for a rope to be tied from earth to heaven, to the sun. Suppose it were possible for an ant to live so long. The ant cannot live so long. That's why the illustration is even weak. But this is the way it can be explained for us to understand. Suppose it were possible for the ant to walk up from earth to the sun. Suppose it were possible not for the ant to be born and then walk back again. When the ant has done that and he has gone up and down, up and down, a hundred times a little fraction of eternity has just passed away. Eternity is long. Suppose it were possible for a little boy to dry up a mighty ocean with a little cup in hand. Just go to that ocean, draw up a little cup of water, pour it away, go back to the ocean, draw up a little cup of water, draw it away. When that boy, if that boy can live long enough to do that, continuing with that method, when he has dried up that ocean, a little negligible, Part of eternity has just passed away. Eternity is long. If it were possible for you to gather together all the books that have ever been written in English language, in French language, in Spanish language, in Greek language, in Latin language, in every language, if it were possible for you to gather all the books together and read everything one by one, when you have read all the books that have ever been written, all the books that have ever been published in every language of the world, when you have finished doing that, a little fraction of eternity has just passed away. Eternity is long. We need to understand the concept of eternity. And if we understand that concept of eternity, it wouldn't matter what you suffer in the ministry. All those people in our churches that you see, they are going to live forever. And therefore, you'll never think of looking back. You'll never think of withdrawing the gospel message from them. They will live forever. And do you know, when we say they are going to live forever, all the things that those people can do in this world, the money they will get in their business will not count in eternity. All the university education they will get in this world, it will not count in eternity. All the enjoyment, all the farm project, all the company uh, prosperity, all the managerial position they have in this world, it will not count in eternity. You know what will count in eternity? The thing you are telling them, that's the only thing that will count in eternity. When they die, every certificate will be forgotten. Every bank account will be forgotten. Every pleasure will be forgotten. Every good name they had will be forgotten. The only thing that will count is what they did was the message you gave to them. Oh, that's something. We're more important than university lecturers. Because after death, the university education they have given them, that stops. That's not account anymore. We're more important than the bank officials. Because after death, all the money they lend them, all the money is no more useful. Everything is finished and forgotten. All the food they have eaten, anything they have done, when they die, the only thing that will count is what you, pastor, what you, evangelist, what you, Sunday school teacher, what you, general superintendent, what you, pastor's wife, what you told them, what they did with what you told them is the only thing that will count in eternity. Think about it this way. If somebody were to travel out of this country 
and he had got every other thing that he could get. The money, the knowledge, the property, the house, everything. And then eventually he was to travel. But the only thing they will check up when he gets to the place he's going is in your hand. And it's very important for him to travel. And because maybe you didn't go to university, because maybe you are not rich, because maybe you do not have big grammar like he has, he didn't bother to come to you. And you too, you didn't bother to come to him. You were ashamed. You said, what do I have? So and so is such a big man. He has so much money, so much uh, housing and all that. So let me just withdraw myself. And let me talk to other people. And yet the only thing that he needs, the thing that really matters, that he needs, is in your hand. And eventually he traveled. And after he traveled, he got to the other place. When he got over there, and he said, uh, what do you have to show you ought to enter into the country? And he said, in Nigeria, I have ten houses. But he said, that's different. Houses are not passports. I have so much money in Nigeria, that's all right, but that's not passport. I have 10 children in Nigeria, that's all right, but that's no passport. What else do you have? I have university education, that's all right, but that's not a passport. You don't have any other thing? How about passport? I thought since I had all these other things, passport is not necessary. You think so? You are intelligent. You know, the people that die without thinking of passport to get to heaven, they are unintelligent. They may have education. I read about the crown. And in those days, in uh, Europe, a king will have a crown. That is to amuse the king, just make him feel happy, make him laugh. And this uh, crown will do a lot of demonstration, a lot of gimmicks, a lot of things that... The king, if he had any sorrow, because of the jesting of that clown, the man will just be happy. And this man was about to die. And uh, they used to call the clown the fool. And so this man about to die, that's the king, as the clown, the professional fool. And he gave him this particular scepter, a golden one. And he said, take this thing in your hand. Search all through Britain. And if you find anybody that is a greater fool than yourself, give this to him. And this man searched and searched all through Britain. And he couldn't find any fool greater than himself. And he came back to the king. And he came just before the king died. Just before the king breathed his last breath. And the king said, have you found the one greater than yourself? In foolery, in ignorance, as a jester, as a clown, he said, no, master. He said, by the way, master, you are going on a long journey. Are you prepared? And the king said, what preparation will I make? I'm not prepared. And the clown gave him that rod, and he said, king, take this. You are a greater fool than myself. I've never seen a man that will go on an eternal journey. A journey you go and never return. A journey you will go and there is suffering in the lake of fire and you will not get prepared. Why did you send me out looking for another fool? There is one here in the palace. You know, if a man will get all the money he can have, all the education he can have, all the children he can have, all the property he can have, without preparing for eternity, as foolishness. And you know, many people in the villages, in the town, everywhere, they are like that. They have not prepared. And the only thing they need in preparation is that it's in your hand. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever get tired. Preach the gospel. Don't ever give up. Preach the gospel. Don't ever look back. Preach the gospel. What the people need in preparing for eternity is in your hand, is in my hand. Don't let them die without knowing. When the Bible says forever and forever, what does that mean? Eternity. Let's look at Revelation chapter 4. 
and in verse 9. When those beasts, the Greek living creatures, give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and forever. From that language, forever and forever refers to the duration of the existence of God or Christ. When the Bible says forever and forever, it means unto the ages of the ages. Ages upon ages in endless succession. And nothing could be more plain. Nothing could be more graphic than the picture of absolute endlessness that God has given us here. The question is now, when we die, where do we go? There have been people that have said, when somebody dies, he dies like a dog. He dies like an animal. He doesn't have a place to go. At school, when I was in the secondary school, they trained us and taught us that there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no prayer, there is no supernatural, there is no miracle. And the principal, he taught us in such a way that we really, most of us who are children, were surprised because he had the command of English. He had the background. He had traveled wide. He had the respect and the honor. And when we children listen to that man, and he'll give illustrations from all over the world, and he gave us some names. And when he gave us those names, I was just a student, I wasn't even born again. But I was a little bit religious. Eventually, when I grew older, I wanted to check off myself because he had taught us to how to check off things, how to read encyclopedias, how to read historical books, how to read biographies. We were trained to do that at school. And so I decided that all these people that are principal at school mentioned, I'm going to check up on them. And one man that he mentioned, a terrible, terrible issue. And I began to read, searching out, and I discovered this book, The Word of Dying Men, Saints and Sinners. You can write that down. The last word of saints and sinners. That's the words that people said. That writer collected all those things together. What people said, when John Wesley was going to die, what he said. When uh, this atheist was going to die, what he said. When this other person was going to die, what he said. Big book. And uh, I saw the name of this man that our principal had been telling us. That he didn't believe in God. He challenged God. You know what happened? When that man was about to die, he began to see the torture, the suffering of hellfire, before he even got to that hellfire, and God opened his eyes to see that ahead of him lay the fiery furnace, and he began to talk aloud, he began to cry aloud, and he said, oh, if I add words, I will give it, if I could recollect all the books I've written against God. But now I'm forsaken by God and forsaken by men and the tortures and the torment of hell. The grief will get hold on me. And I began to cry, who will deliver him? That's how he died. And this principal told us, he only told us about what he did in his younger days. Only told us how he was able to write, abuse God, and nothing happened. He didn't know about how he died. I read of another man that our principal had told us. And this man, when he was about to die, they, they hid him in a separate hospital room. And the nurses, the attendants, were going to him, just to attend to him. And so they covered up, because he was a popular atheist. Terrible, terrible man. Could say anything. He spoke against Christianity. He spoke against the Bible. In fact, before he died, he said, that's when he was still, before he was sick, you know, people will say anything before they are sick. 
people will dream anything before they are sick. He said before he became sick, before he, be, he came into that terrible condition, he said in 50 years, the Bible will be a museum piece. The Bible will be forgotten. You know, from people like that when they talk, they say, if God is there, let him strike me on the head. God is not like that. You don't know God. God can fight a man with ordinary fly. Look at Pharaoh. Who is that God? That I will obey him. And God said, Moses, we have a long way to go. I'll convince him. You will think that God will set up a mighty army and fight against Pharaoh. No. God doesn't need to do that. One day he sent flies. Covered the whole land. Covered all the ports. Covered all the kitchen. Covered all the bedroom. Covered everywhere. And Pharaoh said, pray for me. And after that, he sent frogs. They came out of River Nile. They came out of everywhere. Frogs everywhere. And Pharaoh said, please, entreat the Lord for me this time. And Moses said, glory over me. When will I do that? He said, tomorrow. He said, according to my word, by this time tomorrow, everything is gone. And eventually, God subdued that man. Until even the magicians were telling him, King, this is the finger of God. You said, who well, is that God? We are telling you. Moses could not give you the answer, but we, your own magicians, are telling you, this is the finger of God. God, some people talk carelessly, and they say, what will that God do? I pity you. So you see, that man that I was talking about, the atheist, he said, the Bible will be a museum piece in 50 years. When he was going to die, it was a terrible thing. People didn't know him, but the writer of that uh, book, I told you to write that now, which you can check up later. He met one of the nurses that attended to that man when he was going to die. I said, do you know about so-and-so? He said, yes. He said, yes. Did you remember when, she, when he died? And the woman said, I do not even want to remember the agony, the torture. It was terrible. And the woman said, for any amount of money that the hospital will pay her, she will not like to see another atheist die. That even just seeing them cry, seeing their faces, seeing the agony, she wouldn't want to see another atheist die again. That man died and went to hell. Before he died, he was already crying out. Already crying out. At uh, Bene here, Republic of Bene, that's Kutano uh, in the town, as a church member. You see, this church member was living in adultery. It's a true story. All these things I tell you, this, it's not just parable illustration, true story. He was playing the trumpet in that church. I don't want to mention the church. And uh, he was living in adultery. And God was faithful to him. And God said, repent, change. Because life is not like this. And he went to an adultery. And that particular day, God told him, at 12 noon, you will die. He ran to the church. That's why I don't want to mention the church. In the morning. And he started praying, started praying. The time had passed. At 12 o'clock, he was still on that altar, praying and crying to the Lord. He gave up. While he gave up, the church members, because in that church, they had people that, you know, just were around that time. They just, when they saw him praying, nobody wondered, nobody did anything about that. They just felt that he had a problem and he came to the church to pray. But exactly at 12, he died. And he began to go around. He began to go around. Because they needed to inform his people. And they were afraid that, so that the police will not say, because uh, Kutano was very tense at that time about the preaching of the gospel. And they were afraid that the government might say that church people had killed that man, their trumpeter. While they were going around, 
he was having a particular experience. And eventually, as he went around wanting to see what to do for the burial to inform the people, the news was spreading. Eventually, he woke up. But when he woke up, it's bad. You know, when somebody dies, the touch him is very, very cold and very, very sweet. When the touch is back, it was so hot, they couldn't put their hands on that bag. And he told them that when he died, the Lord told him that because you are afraid and you are praying, I'm going to send you back, but I'll teach you a lesson. And he took him right to the very gate of hell. And his back faced that fire of hell. When you woke up here at Kotonu here, not up to 100 kilometers, that place was still hot. The hell fire. In Cameroon, some years ago, a herbalist became sick. True story. As this herbalist was very, very sick, he was about to die. And while he was about to die, he saw Jesus on one hand, and he saw the devil, fierce-looking, terrible-looking on the other hand. And Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus just stood there, mild, soft, quiet, and calm, just looking at him. Eyes of pity and sympathy. And the devil, on the other hand, said, hurry up, you are my property. Let's go. And the herbalist became afraid. He became afraid. He started trembling and shaking. And he, as he was afraid, he started pleading and crying. And Jesus didn't say anything. But the devil kept on hurrying him up, saying, the time is over. You've spent your time. You've done everything you want to do. Now you'll follow me. You set me here, and you should be able to bear the consequence. He was afraid. He didn't want to go. He didn't want to die. And Jesus Thank God for Jesus. Jesus. That name. The lover of our soul. The savior of the sinner. The redeemer of those who have gone astray. His name is Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus told him, he pointed at him, you are set free. And the devil vanished. And the man got healed. When he got healed, he piled all his instruments of doing herbal work together, burnt everything, bought a Bible. Without any invitation, he went to church. When he got to the church, the people were wondering. Because there was a person that nobody would dream of preaching to. So they asked him, what was he doing? What's the matter? Why? And he told them the story. And he made up his mind that whatever will happen, he will not go to that hell. That's why I was rescued. Many years ago, there was a man who was in the army. And this man in the army, because of all the fighting and all the things, he sustained some injuries. Eventually, to cut a long story short, he died. And as he died, he prepared the coffin, the deed, everything. And they were carrying him from one place to the other. As they were carrying him from this place to the other, it was now about two days after he had died, and the funeral was just about to take place. One of the soldiers carrying him stumbled, and the head, uh, the head part of the coffin knocked the ground, and they heard groaning from inside the coffin, and they opened up that thing, and they looked, and they saw that there was life now in him, and they attended to him. After attending to him, eventually he got well. It's a long, long story. And when he got well, he began going to church and serving the Lord. And then he wrote, uh, he spoke to the person that wrote the account for 48 hours in hell. And it was a terrible time. And so we need to understand that eternity is long, long, 
laws unending. And when sinners die, they go to hell. And the message is in your hand. Multitudes are going to hell. I said, God, last year alone. From the Ministry of Health. That in Nigeria here, 1.6 million people died. You know the meaning of 1.6 million? That's almost the whole of the population of Republic of Benin. That's almost like half of the population of Togo died in Nigeria alone. And I said that from state to state, sometimes you wonder how I could go ahead just preaching and preaching and preaching. Oh, my brothers and sisters, when I see the people that are dying, the people that are dying, the people that are dying. I got from the newspaper last year, from January to December. I told my secretary, my secretary, you help me. I want to keep on my fire, my vision. Get all the papers from January to December and help me type out all the people that died, how they died, what happened to them. I'd like to read them. And my secretary star, uh, sat on all those papers and he took the Guardian, he took uh, um, Daily Times and he took Concord and he took all these newspapers and he cut them out. And he typed them out. And he typed them out. And he gave it to me. I said, thank you, Secretary. You are helping my ministry. And when I read that and read that and read that, when I finished reading all that, I knew I should continue preaching. People are dying. People are dying. People are dying. And you know, if they die without knowing Jesus, what does the Bible say? In Revelation chapter 20, from verse 11, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whence, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book, according to their work. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their work. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. You know why? Death was not to kill anybody now in eternity. Therefore death itself was cast into the lake of fire. That's the death of death. And hell was thrown into the lake of fire. You think hell is terrible? The lake of fire is more terrible. And it says this is the second death. This is the destruction, the cessation of death. This is the death of death. And it says whosoever was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 14. And I'm looking at verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. But thank God for those who are born again, there is heaven. For those who have known the Lord, there is heaven. Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, as a sky, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. No wonder these apostles of old, he tortured them, but you know they will not yield. I read about Peter, Simon Peter, who was a coward by the time Jesus was being taken. But you know Simon Peter. A terrible persecution broke out at their time. And the Lord had prophesied and told him that, that when you were young, you went with, with whithersoever you wanted. But when you are old, you'll stretch forth your hand. Another man will lead you where you didn't want to go. Prophesying about his death. And they wanted to crucify Simon Peter. But he didn't know it. He didn't say this suffering is too much for me because of the gospel. He said, 
You want to crucify me with my head up, my feet down, like my master? No, do me this favor so that I'm not like my master. Turn my head upside down and crucify me. I'll be all right. You saw heaven. Look at Stephen. We're told that one young man called Saul, he held onto his clothes. And he looked up and he saw heavens open. Oh yes, there is heaven. And he saw Jesus standing on the right hand side of God. The Bible says that when Jesus ascended up on high, he sat down. But when the saint was about to go, come home, he stood up in attention to welcome him. He stood up and, and Stephen said, I see the heavens open and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And he started stoning him. He didn't care about the stoning. When you see heaven, you won't care about stoning. When you see heaven, you won't care about gossip. When you see heaven, you won't care about difficulty. You won't care about persecution. He knelt down and his stones were raining upon him. He said, Lord, I don't have any problem. They have a problem. Forgive them and receive my spirit. And he went asleep and he died. There is heaven when there will be no more pain. There will be no more curse. There will be no more sickness. I will be worshipping the Lord ever and ever and ever. God will call you because you are faithful in the little things. That ministry you say is little, be faithful. Only five members in the church, that's where we start, be faithful. And only um, a village ministry, be faithful. Because you are faithful in that little thing, come and reign over five cities and reign over ten cities. When you see heaven, when you know about heaven, you will never look back. We're not going to look back. We're following on. Toil on, and your toil rejoice. After work, there comes rest. After exile, home. Then you will hear the midnight cry. Behold, I come. Let's rise up and pray. Our precious Father in heaven, we come before you this morning to thank you very much because once again you have opened our eyes to see beyond the now. You have drawn the curtain so that we can see eternity ahead. Lord, we thank you because you chose us as your ministers and ministers of life. You called us and you gave us the word of life so that the souls of men will hear and they will live. And this morning, Heavenly Father, you reminded us of the need to continue without wavering without discouragement and this very time we we'll remember Paul the Apostle who said I have fought the good fight I have kept finished the course and kept the faith and this morning Heavenly Father we pray that you will give us the endurance to continue keeping the faith in the name of Jesus Christ Father we understand that the souls of men are undying, and that the souls of men shall live for eternity. What can a man exchange for his life? Nothing. Nothing at all. Because the human soul is so precious, is so valuable. And this morning, Heavenly Father, you remind us again that we are committed to saving people's lives with the gospel power. And I pray that this morning you will give us more courage more strength, more power, more anointing to continue day by day in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that people are dying every day. Men are dying. And even right now, those who are still living in the spirit man, they are crying. Who will help us? Who will teach us? Who will instruct us? Who will show us the way of life? And here we are this morning. We have received your mercy. We have received your grace. We have received your calling to so go into the world and preach the gospel. Father in heaven, I pray that this morning 
no one shall be discouraged any longer in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I'm asking, oh God, that you will give us all the power, all the enablement to continue to the very day of the end. I'm asking, oh God, that as we shine, as we preach, as we minister in our little tunnels, I pray that men's souls shall be saved more and more in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we know whatever little we contribute matters to, to your kingdom. And so this morning I'm asking, oh God, that we shall continue to contribute our little so that human female souls shall be getting saved more and more in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that heaven is a reality. We know that hell also is a reality. We can understand, we can perceive it. And even your spirit tells us in our inner man that heaven is real. And I'm asking, oh Heavenly Father, that even in our own lives, we shall be pure. We shall be sincere. And we shall be honest. And we shall keep the faith to the end in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, this is no time to resign from the gospel work. This is no time to hang our hallows. This is no time to be discouraged. This is no time to drag our feet. This is no time to move slowly. It is time to put our life and everything we have so that people can hear the gospel. And I pray this morning, O oh God, that you will give us that grace that we shall put all our life, all our enablement, all our talents, all our energy, all our education, everything we have to the gospel work in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we know that you are able to keep us to the very end. We, because we know it's a privilege to have such a power in our acting vessel. It's a privilege to be so chosen by you, to be so called by you, to be so admitted by you, so that we can preach the gospel. And I pray that, Father, we shall never lose the privilege in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord in heaven, we believe you this year. We believe that, Father, this very last day, Lord, I'm asking that you will pour the revival upon this nation through us. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, as we renew our determination, as we renew our concentration, as our visions become brighter, Lord, I will pray more, we study more, we determine more. I pray that this whole nation shall be shaken with your power, with your gospel, and Lord, over the north, over the south, in the east and the west, everywhere, the gospel of Jesus shall reign supreme, and men and women shall be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you this morning. I will pray, O oh God, that our faith in your word will continue. Our understanding about heaven and hell will continue. Our vision will be brighter day by day. And this morning, O oh God, if there's anyone here whose vision is blown, who is thinking of retirement, giving up, I pray that, Father, the spirit of courage, of strength, of power, will come upon such person in the name of Jesus Christ. Renew our energy, O God. Write in our vision, Heavenly Father. And keep us going. Thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, 